Don't you find it hard to believe that tomorrow is 2018? I know I do. Where does the time go? Where have all the years gone? Two things have recently occurred to me. I've never been this old before. <laughs> and I'll never be this young again. I was born in 1948. In 2018, I will celebrate my 70th birthday. For those of you who are young people, the ones that I consider young would be probably 40 and under, would probably classify me as elderly. For those of you who are old enough to be my parents, you probably think of me as just a kid, and I hear that a lot in this church. I was born again in January of 1970. I was 21 years old. Next week, I'll celebrate my 48th spiritual birthday. Occasionally, I think about the changes that I've seen in my lifetime. Some good, some not so good. The America of 2018 is definitely not the America of 1948 by a long shot. When I was a young man, my thoughts tend to head towards the future, what I would do, where I would go, what I would see. But as I've grown older, I find myself spending more time remembering. And that's what I want us to do today. We're going to be looking back at 2017 and all the things that God has done for us in our lifetime. I'm reminded of a song that uh, was very popular back in the 60s. Those of you who were born after that, I'm sorry you don't have the joy of knowing some of the great songs from back then. But there was a couple of men that sang a, a really great song. And I love the words to it. And it's, it's so thoughtful because it deals with memories and remembering the things that are important to us. The song was written by Simon and Garfunkel. And it was sung, and these are some of the words to it. Time it was, and what a time it was, it was. A time of innocence. A time of confidences. Long ago, it must be, I have a photograph. Preserve your memories. They're all that's left to you. I like that last verse. The last, the last words. Preserve your memories. They're all that's left you. And as we get older, we begin to have more and more memories, do we not? I'm not the same man I was 48 years ago. Thank God. I have changed. My unchanging God has changed me. There are some things I try very, very hard to forget. There are some things in my life that I tried very, very hard to remember. Now I said all that because if you're like me, you tend to be forgetful about things. And I do find as I get older, and I see you nodding your head, yes, I tend to forget more and more than I used to. But we need to constantly be reminded of the promises of God. It's a constant thing. We also need to constantly be reminded of the benefits that he's given to his children, to you and me. In hard times, in difficult times, what does our nature do? It tends to leave God out because we want to handle things ourselves. Instead of immediately pouring our hearts out to God and asking him for direction and guidance, we tend to go off and do what we want to do. We finagle and we fight and we struggle and we worry and we lose sleep. And what appears to be normal, a normal pattern for dealing with our problems is actually sin. Worry is sin. This is especially true when it comes to our personal relationships with one another. After all our efforts fail, we eventually, eventually get around to praying and asking God what we should do. I know this to be true because it's experienced in, in my life as well. This is why daily time in God's word, every day in God's word and in prayer, reminds us of who God is and how he has blessed you and me. So this morning I want to look at, and never forget, five of God's many benefits. 
For the last five weeks, we've been reading in Psalm 103, and I thought it would be a good idea if we took just a little bit closer look at it, at least the first five verses. So if you're still open there to Psalm 103, I'm going to be reading the first five verses to remind us of five of the benefits of God. Five of the benefits of God. The Bible says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And here they are. Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Let's pray. Father, it is my prayer this morning that if anyone came here this morning discouraged or depressed or is perhaps dealing with post-Christmas blues or is anxious about what the new year will bring, that as they recall how God has blessed them, they will receive a new perspective on life, a new way of looking at things, and a new appreciation for all the blessings that only you can provide. We pray these things in the spirit and the character of Jesus our Savior. Amen. These verses that we just read emphasize the importance of remembering. It's important to remember. It's a big deal with Christians. In fact, we are commanded by Christ to do this in remembrance of me. And that deals with, of course, as we all know, Communion. And once a month in this church, we partake in the communion. So it's important to remember. And then I ask myself, well, what else does God want us to remember? Well, there's a portion of the scripture in the Old Testament that deals with the Israelites, but I think it is very applicable to you and me today. So turning your Bibles to Deuteronomy, I want to read to you Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I want to read verses 11 through 19. The principle is the same. Although this is written thousands of years ago, I think we can all identify with how God wants us to not forget him, to acknowledge him in our lives. So I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 19. God's word says, Be, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances. Let me just stop right there and say, we have basically two fundamental commandments, do we not? To love God, to love others. That's the law that we're under, and once you live in that law, you don't need any of the other laws. What about the Sabbath? His, his statues, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, and have built good houses and lived in them, and when you herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness, which is fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness, he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my heart made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Our sin nature hungers for recognition, does it not? We want people to notice us, to think that we're something that we're perhaps not. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look how successful my business is. Look at the car I drive. Look at the house I live in. I've done all this myself. 
Everything that we have and everything that we have done is because of the grace of God. I think we tend to forget that sometimes. Sadly, what do we do? We whine about everything. Never satisfied, never happy with what we have. We're never content. Young people, those of you under 40, I can promise you this very thing. Everything in this life is not always going to come out the way that you plan for it to. You're going to be tried. You're going to be tested. Your faith is going to be tested. Plan on it. Proverbs 16, 9 16, 9 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his paths, directs his steps. Look again at Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. Notice the repetition of the words, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. It indicates the intensity and the earnestness of David. The word bless is found six times in this particular chapter. It means to praise or to speak well of someone or to acknowledge goodness. The praise and goodness acknowledged here is directed toward God and no one else. David understood the goodness of God, did he not? From deep within his soul, with every fiber of his being, he gives honor to God. He recognizes God's goodness. And he begins to proclaim it in this chapter. He identifies five benefits of God that should never be forgotten. Five benefits that reveal the never-changing character of God. In these verses, David asks for nothing but is simply wanting to give thanks to God. This is a personal call to worship for him. A call to be thankful to our loving God. It's as, if, it's as if David is reminding himself of what's truly important. He does not want to become complacent. He doesn't want to go through the motions, as it were, as many times we do. We go to church because that's what we do. We go to church. We go to Sunday school because we go to Sunday school. He didn't want to be there, and you can almost sense that in his life. He desires more of God, not less of God. He's not satisfied with the status quo. So as we move forward in these verses, we will begin to see the reasons behind his desire to bless the Lord. And there are five things that I want, to no want us to notice. The first unforgettable and unchanging benefit, he says, who pardons all your iniquities. All the word who precedes the benefits. They're not questions, but they're statements. He's making five statements about God and his character. Now, if there was ever a man who understood about God's pardon for sin, it was David. He had committed adultery. He had committed first-degree murder. He had committed uh, much lying to cover up his sin. But I find it interesting that David begins God's most important benefit to us. He begins with the most important benefit to you and me. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. We have been forgiven. He pardons our iniquities or he pardons our sins. Not most, not some, but all. And just like David, we too have been pardoned by our forgiving God. Don't you find rest in that? Don't you find peace in that? I know I do. And just like David, we too have been pardoned by a forgiving God. Where would we be without the forgiveness of God? We couldn't buy forgiveness with all the gold in the world. You do know that, right? We can't. We couldn't earn God's forgiveness with all of the deeds, the millions of deeds that can be done, all the good deeds. We can't earn that. This forgiveness came at no cost to us, but at a great cost to our God. So how does this forgiveness happen? How is this accomplished? How is this forgiveness even possible? Well, there's a verse in Isaiah that I think sums it up quite well. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, in the King James Version of the Bible, it says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. Not some of us, all of us, 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. Our sins were laid on the back of Christ. How difficult would it have been for the father to have watched his son suffer like that? How impossible would it be for you and me to watch our children suffer like that? Yet the Bible says in Isaiah 53, 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. The Lord was pleased to crush him. The sins of the world were laid on Jesus. That's how this forgiveness is possible. You know what? He's still forgiving today because we are still sinning and repenting today. The second unforgettable and unchanging benefit, he says, who heals all your diseases? This is Hebrew poetry. It's parallelism. It's not like our rhyming poetry, you know, where we rhyme words at the end of each line. What it's talking about here is a balanced line type of poetry, Hebrew poetry. Do you see the balance, Do you see the balance in these verses? Pardons iniquities. Heals diseases, redeems pit, loving kindness and compassion, satisfaction. Look at the parallelism in verse 3. The two clauses are practically equal. Now on the surface, on the surface, it sounds like God heals all our physical diseases. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying at all. It's also not condoning the word of faith movement. James Montgomery Boyce said this, This verse has played an important uh, but unwarranted role in some systems of theology that stress what is called healing in the atonement, meaning that if we have been saved from sin by Christ, we have been healed or have a right to be healed of any physical affliction too. This is bad theology. Because it is simply not true that those who have been forgiven for sin are spared or have a right to be spared all diseases. Believers do get sick and many passages teach that God has his purposes in the sicknesses. How many of you who are Christians this morning have ever been sick? Would you raise your hand? My point. Apparently all humans, all humans, will eventually die physically, even Christians, if the Lord tarries. This verse is not advocating all Christians will have perpetual healing from every illness. It's not. If that were true, Christians would never die. And if Christians never die, then unsaved people would want to be Christians for the wrong reason. I'm not saying God doesn't heal. Of course he heals. Most of us know people who have been miraculously healed by God. I talked to a lady yesterday. God has miraculously saved her from cancer. She was diagnosed with cancer. I mean, it showed up on the, on the film. Her, her, all of her tests said, you're going to die. And she turned it over to the Lord, and he healed her. Does he heal everybody? Well, obviously not. Not everybody, but he did in her case. He doesn't, but not in the same supernatural phenomenal way that the, that the apostles healed. Do I still pray for people that are sick? Well, I hope to tell you I do. That's a big part of what I pray about each day is for people to, to feel better. We have a lot of sick people in our church right now. A lot of people are dealing with pneumonia and, and, and the flu and uh, uh, cedar fever. And they just feel like, well, they don't feel very good. I still pray for these people because we have a loving God. Why are some people and others are not? Here's my answer. Ask God. Because I don't know. Ask God. I don't have the power to manipulate God. And you don't either. But I still pray for people. He is God and we are not. I love what R.C. Sproul used to say quite often. We're just dirt. We're dirt. We're going to all turn to dust one day. Faith doesn't always determine what happens. 
Faith follows the will of God. There's a big difference. Physical healing is not in my hands, but in the hands of a loving God. Healing in this context, however, is the same as spiritual forgiveness. In Jeremiah 30, verses 12 through 15, Israel is described as a sick person. For thus the Lord, for thus says the Lord, your wound is incurable and your injury is serious. There is no one to plead your cause, no healing for you, you're sore, no recovery for you. All your lovers have forgotten you, they do not seek you, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the punishment of a cruel one, because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. Why do you cry out over your injury? Your pain is incurable because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. I have done these things to you. I have done these things to you. Do you see it? Do you see it? This healing is balanced with being pardoned, being forgiven. Think of the sick, sickness of pride. Think how sick that is to be prideful. Think of being sick with a superior ego, thinking that you are above everyone else and you know more than everyone else and how smart you are and how gifted you are. Think about going through life with that kind of an ego. Think about the disease of bitterness. Do you know anybody that's bitter? They're never happy, they're never satisfied, they're always angry, and they're bitter at the world. They're bitter at God. What about the illness of jealousy or greed? Think about that for a moment. If hatred is kept all bottled up inside, it will eat you up and it will eventually kill you. Stress will kill you. The miracle of physical healing is a good thing. The miracle of spiritual healing, healing is a better thing. The Bible tells us there is a direct link between sin and disease. There is also a direct link between obedience and healing. Sickness and death came into this world because of sin. That's why it's here, because of sin. Healing us of sickness is to God the same as forgiving us of sin. Exodus 15, 26 says, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. He is our healer. Now, because of common grace, our bodies have the capacity and are designed to uh, be healed because of the immune system that God has given each one of us. The natural healing God has provided is wonderful. The miraculous healing he does is amazing. Eventually, however, we will all die and return to dust. It's a fact. But that is not the end, and that's what he's trying to tell us. That's not the end. God wins in the end. God has already won over sin and disease. One day in the resurrection, in the resurrection, God has promised to redeem us with, guess what, wait for it, new bodies. A new body. Yes, I'm anxious to get mine. Thank you very much. I find it interesting that forgiveness is followed by healing and restoration. Don't you find that interesting? That after we're healed, we're restored after sickness. Third unforgettable and unchanging benefit. Who redeems your life from the pit? The word pit in the King James Version is destruction. It is equivalent to the grave, the ultimate place of corruption, obviously. Who redeems your life from destruction or corruption? Redeem or redemption is a, ba a big word. We use it a lot around here. It's a biblical word. Its secular definition is this. It is the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing debt. In its biblical definition, there are two fundamental ideas. Redemption from the penalty of the law and redemption to the new life in Christ. In other words, God removed us from the penalty of sin. He has now given us a new life in his family. 
We've been bought and paid for if we're Christians today. We now have a new life of liberty in Christ, which we didn't have before. The death of Christ is the, is the redemptive price he paid for you and for me. As Christians, we find redemption in no one and nothing else. There's nothing else out there that we can or will be redeemed by. How do I know that? Well, it just sounds good, doesn't it? No, that's not the reason I know that. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. This is what it says. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no one. There is nothing else. It's all Jesus. As we consider the benefits of God, never forget that we've been rescued. Have you ever been rescued before? I have. It's, a, it's an amazing feeling of relief, and you break down in tears. You ever seen anybody rescued from a, from a mine that's ca caved in? They get out and they, they kiss the ground. They're so thankful. They're so thankful that they've been saved, that they've been delivered. That's the way David feels at this moment. David is filled with gratitude, and he's remembering God's providence in his life. He'd been delivered from the from the lion's fangs and from the claws of the bear, if you remember. He'd been delivered from Goliath's sword and the javelin of King Saul. He'd been delivered from the Philistines and from his son's rebellion. He'd been delivered from all of that. And he was thanking God for all of that. I'm pretty sure we can all be grateful for God's providence in our own lives. We can certainly be grateful that we have been redeemed from destruction. The fourth unforgettable and unchanging benefit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. God has not only redeemed us from the pit, he has crowned us with loving kindness and compassion. I'm not the easiest person in the world to love, I admit that. However, over the years I've been the recipients of much love, kindness, and compassion. I've had many of my brothers and sisters in Christ demonstrate boundless, unboundless love toward me. I've been loved by my parents. I've been loved by my grandparents. I've been loved by my brother and my sisters, my uncles, my aunts, and my cousins. I have a wife who has loved me for over 44 years. I know y'all think she's uh, only in her 40s, but she's not. I love you. <laughs> I, have even grown, I have even grown children and grandchildren that love their old dad. I have been loved. But no one has ever loved me the way that Jesus loves me. No one. Look at those words again. God has crowned us with his loving kindness and compassion. That's why I had and wanted to have Charlie sing today. And I appreciate that so much, Charlie, you and Mary singing that. I love that song. It's not a deep theological song, but it says so much. It's kind of like, Jesus loves me, this I know. What more do you need to know? No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And that's true. It's important to notice we're not crowning ourselves here. Thank goodness. We don't rely on other people to crown us either. God crowns us. I have never done anything in my entire life to deserve being crowned by God. Not one thing. He crowns us with loving kindness or mercy and compassion. His love for us never wavers. It never fades. It never disappears and it never ends. He loves us. We need to remember that. We need to think about that day after day after day. We have a God who truly does love us and has given his all for you and me. The fifth unforgettable and unchanging benefit, who satisfies your years with good things? Satisfaction. We hear that a lot. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 20, 
The eyes of man are never satisfied. Someone once said that comparison is the thief of joy. I believe that to be very true in all areas of our lives. Advertising wants us to compare what we have with others have. You deserve a bigger house. You deserve finer clothes. You deserve a, a really great vacation. You deserve all that. My attitude is I want what he's got because what I have is not good enough, so I want what he's got. In 1967, in 1967, I was 19 years old. I'd just gotten my, my very first car. It was a 1963 Pontiac Le Mans. I remember I paid $1,400 for it. I was so proud of that car. Every Saturday, I would put it on the driveway of my mom and dad's house, and I'd go out there and I'd detail that thing. I mean, I spent like four hours. It was beautiful. Burgundy, black interior. It wasn't leather. Couldn't afford leather. I don't even know if they made leather in Pontiacs back in those days, but had four on the floor. I loved that car. I was so proud of that car. I mean, it was my car. And I, I, just, I, I just couldn't get... Uh, more excited about anything in my life than my car, and I just, I love that car. One day, on a Saturday, I'll disti I distinctly remember this. I lived on, in San Antonio, and I lived on a very long street. And as I'm detailing my car and just admiring it and everything, I hear this rumbling sound. And from far away, I could barely see this black car coming toward me. And as it got closer, the rumbling got louder. I mean, it really sounded cool, you know. Glass packs or whatever was on, you know. Fine, fine sounding vehicle. And as, I, as, I, as it draw, drew closer, I saw that it was, in fact, a 1966 black Corvette Stingray. Well, I'm sure that as I'm standing there, as I'm standing here now, I was probably just like this, and I was with my mouth open and drool coming down both corners of my mouth. <laughs> and as it, as it drove out of sight, I just kind of, oh, wow. And then I looked at my car, <laughs> and I thought about the Corvette, and it occurred to me, this doesn't satisfy me anymore. I want that black Corvette. That's our nature, is it not? We're never satisfied. We always want something. Let me tell you something about being greener on the other side of the grass or the fence. You know what's green over there is not grass. Those are weeds, brother. Those are weeds over there. That's what's green. <laughs> This is why mission trips to third world countries are so important. Especially for young people. They get a bird's eye view of how great America really is. You know what? I, I don't know if I'd want to live on a dirt floor. I don't believe I'd want to live like that. Suddenly, they realize that living in America is not so bad after all. There's something that I saw on, on Facebook uh, a week or two ago. Um, I don't normally comment on that, but sometimes I save things that, that, are, that are pretty impressive. I have to tell you, there was, this, uh, there was this young boy, and obviously it was a third world country, and his mother apparently, or his dad, I don't know who, had built a fire. And on top of the fire, there was what looked like a wok, a wok that was maybe this big, you know, a metal pan like this. And in the pan, there was water. And in the water was a boy, and he was taking a bath. He was taking a bath because he wanted hot water. Well, obviously, if he stayed in there too long, he would be dinner for someone, I would think. <laughs> but he was just pouring the water over his head with a little plastic <laughs> container. Just, and he was laughing and smiling, and he was having like, this is the greatest thing ever, hot water. He's an inch away from being burned alive. And he's just having a great time. There was no zest soap there for him. There was no Irish spring for him to use. He didn't have any conditioner or, 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 or shampoo or anything. He was just rinsing his body off because that's what he had. 
And I got to thinking about that. I thought, here is someone who is grateful that he has a place to bathe and it's not cold. It's warm. I think sometimes we need to... I, I, I say that because I want to keep looking back at that, reminding me if I ever get to that point where I start complaining about something, thank you God, that I, I don't know that the boy had ever seen a real bathtub or not. So we, we have much to be thankful for. You know, it's like people who complain about having gray hair. <laughs> don't come up to me and complain about gray hair. You have hair. Just saying. Do you know what? You know the reason why we're not satisfied outside of Christ? Do you know the reason why? Because God made us in His image. That's why. We have been made in His image. John 15, 5 tells us as Christians, we are satisfied in Christ when we're tapped into the vine of Christ. That's when we're satisfied. He doesn't satisfy us with good things because we deserve them. He satisfies us with good things because he loves us. What we deserve is hell. What God has given us is heaven. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were still rebellious, we were self-centered, we were egotistical idiots. God loved us and died for us. Even then, he died for us. So before we move forward into 2018, which is tomorrow, let's all look back and remember how God has pardoned our sin, healed our diseases, redeemed our lives, crowned us with loving kindness and compassion, and satisfied our years with good things. This psalm does not teach the doctrine of salvation. It tells us what it feels like to be saved. That's what it does. Would you bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? If you don't know what it feels like to be saved, I would urge you today to receive Christ as your Savior. I would urge you to repent of your sin and ask for his forgiveness and live for him. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have to open your word and help us to always be the kind of people that remember the benefits of God. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me, please? Hallelujah.